The following message was recorded at Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. More information can be found online at Bethlehem.Church. Let's pray together. So, Father, we come now to this somber text in your word, this text where we see in action the phrase we love so much here at Bethlehem, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And we want to see Jesus this morning. We want to see him high and lifted up, the worthy Savior and leader and Lord and judge and King of kings. And Lord, we want to bow to him this morning. And that's a miracle of grace. And so we're praying now for your spirit to come through your word and make much of your son that we would leave here changed. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the story of, of the book of Acts, which is really the story of the church throughout the ages, is really the story of God with his people. It's a story throughout the whole Bible. God with His people, by the power of the Spirit, to bless them, to keep them, to sustain them so that they can spread the fame of His name by the power of His Spirit. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. Praise God. We're going to be there someday soon. And until we get there, He says He's come and made His place in us. Praise God. God, until the day when our faith becomes sight, Jesus dwells in us and among us by His Spirit. So I just want to say this when we come to somber texts like this, and maybe you've been having a a week like I've had where every room you walk into, you just go, Oh Lord, I need your help. Oh Lord, this is hard. Whatever you are facing right now, because of the blood of Jesus, God is with us as we take up our cross and run the race set before us. And it's good to remember that He has set these races before us. Right? He's set these races before us. He has prepared the good works beforehand for us to walk in. We should not lean away from Jesus or seek to numb the pain that we feel in the race that He's given us to run. Rather, we should lean in and rest in Jesus and trust Him. And the promise of the Bible is that He will give us His Spirit to help us as we seek to fight against the brokenness and sin of this world which is in us and around us. And the brokenness comes in all forms and fashions. We shouldn't compare. We shouldn't try to figure out who's suffering most, what's worst. It comes in all forms and fashions, right? It comes in cancer and it comes in criticism. The brokenness comes. It comes in in lust, and it comes in loneliness. It comes in great pain, and it comes in persecution. It comes in heartbreak over a number of things, and it comes in hatred. It comes in depression, and it comes in disease. And in all these things, before we get into this text this morning, hear the promise of Jesus I will never leave you or forsake you. Do you hear your Lord saying that to you this morning? I will never leave you or forsake you. God has promised to be a very present help in our time of need. If you don't feel Him, it's not because He's not there, because He keeps His promises. He has promised to make His power perfect in our weakness. He has promised, I will finish the good work which I began in you. This is the story of Acts. God's powerful presence with His people for their sustaining good and the glory of His name. And so, as we read these stories, as we read about Stephen, I don't want you to view these events as if superheroes are involved. We put him up on this other pedestal. All of the powerful things that happen, happen by God's faithful presence to help His people in faithful living. So if you're here today, if you're here this morning, and you walked in, and you have difficult and maybe even what feels like disastrous circumstances, God has not left you. 
He will keep His promises. He will sustain us as a people until the day we see Him. He will help you fight your sin. Right? We're good, reformed people that believe in total depravity, but some of us got to get back in the fight go, I have the Holy Spirit living within me. He's going to help me fight my sin. He promises He will help us fight our sin. He will help us stand in the midst of suffering. He will help us stand in the midst of a culture that is breaking down and hostile towards us more and more every day. Do you believe that, church? Do you believe that He's with us? He's for us. He's going to be with us and for us until the day we see Him face to face. So as we come to this text, that's what's happening. Behind the scene, behind the mob, behind Stephen's action is the Holy Spirit keeping God's promise to be with His people for the sake of His name. And He'll be with us. Alright, point number one. Let's dive into this ugly and sometimes text. Verse 54, the venom of the rulers. It says, Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at Him. So as the rulers and some of the people that are part of this mob realize what Pastor Daniel unpacked so well last week, that he is not really on trial, but he's putting them on trial. As they realize that's happening, that he's turned the tables on them and made accusations against them, they don't respond well. Right? If Stephen's face is glowing like an angel, their faces are not doing that. They are not at peace. Kids, I don't know if you ever play checkers, but all my kids are just really learning and starting to love checkers. And one of the things my kids love to do to me, especially if I'm not paying very close attention, is to let me jump one of their pieces so that they set me up for a double jump. It's like their favorite thing, right? <laughs> you missed it. And that's what Stephen just did to these rulers. Yeah, he's under trial, and he'll let them make some accusations. They thought they were winning, but he just double jumped them and showed them that they were the ones that were wicked. They were the ones like the generations before them that had been rejecting and crucifying all the prophets of God and ultimately the Savior of the world. I mean, the case is clear. They're indicted. They're guilty if the right kind of trial was happening. And as they realize that they're the ones on trial and that He's found them guilty, they are enraged. Now, what we're going to keep seeing in Acts, and what we've seen so far, is that regularly, the people who preach the gospel of Jesus Christ do not hold back from just saying, you killed Jesus. You killed Jesus. You killed the Savior. You're supposed to be the rulers of this people who know the law and should have seen Him coming, and you just totally missed Him. You killed Him. We saw Peter do that twice already, right? He did it in Acts 2. He did it in Acts 5. And so what I want to do is just read you the two responses from those sermons. So Peter preaches in Acts 2, you killed the Messiah. And here's the response of the people in verse 37 of Acts 2. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter answers and says, repent. And they do. And all these thousands are saved. Well, the same thing happens with the rulers in chapter 5. Peter says, you're guilty of the blood of Jesus. And here's their response in chapter 5, verse 33. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. So these are the responses. We'll see throughout the whole book of Acts. Rejection of Jesus, anger, frustration, or repentance. There's no middle ground with Jesus. You love Him or you hate Him. You repent or you reject Him. So what do we do as the church? Well, one of the reasons I bring up these responses is because sometimes what I see in, in the church as we speak the name, name of Jesus or we, we kind of want to live out the ways of Jesus is I see this surprise, this frustration, this anger that rises up in us, and we're like, I can't believe the world is reacting this way. And I just want to show you, it's, it's always been this way. Here's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2, 15-16. Paul, who is showing up in our passage as Saul, here's what he says. We are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one 
a fragrance from death to death to the other a fragrance from life to life. So as we look around, see a culture increasingly enraged at the name and ways of Jesus Christ, we should not be surprised. This is how it's always been, and this is how it will be. Right? The gospel of Jesus, for us in this room, at least for most of us in this room, is the sweetest news in the world. We've realized our sin is an offense against a holy God, deserving of eternal punishment, and we're cut to the heart, and we realize, I can still have life in Jesus. Oh my goodness, it's the best news in the world. It's the aroma of life to life. Eternal life is mine now and forever. But to those who have hard hearts, it's a horrible message. (laughs) What does the gospel say to those with hard hearts? You're wicked. You're a sinner. It's not just the stuff you do is bad, but you're bad to the core. You need to repent. You need to submit to someone else. That is an enraging message for those with a soft, without a softened heart. How can it not be? It's offensive. What is our job, church? Faithfully spread the fragrance of the knowledge of Jesus everywhere. Smell like Jesus in every room you're in. That His fragrance would go forth in every room And that's why we keep saying breathe in the Word, breathe out prayer, fast, pray, come to Jesus, dwell with Jesus, smell like Jesus wherever you are. To some, by the grace of God, maybe to some of your neighbors who don't know Jesus, some of your co-workers who don't know Jesus, to some it will be the aroma of life. And God will use you as the means of grace that people would come to repentance. And then to others... It will be the aroma of death. This is the dividing line of all humanity. See our sin, receive our Savior, and submit to our King, or ignore our sin, reject our Savior, and live as if we're King. Those are the dividing lines in the sand. Point number two, the vision of Stephen. Listen to verses 55 to 56. It says, But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, And he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. I just want to draw out a couple things from these verses. Uh, Bruce mentioned this dichotomy in his welcome. As the rulers and the people grow more unsettled and more enraged, Stephen seems to be growing more settled and more at peace all the time. Why? Well, I just want you to see it's because God is keeping His promise to never leave us or forsake us. Do you see that here? How does Stephen see these things he sees? The text doesn't leave us like questioning how it happens. It says he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. In his moment of need, the Holy Spirit comes... And fills him. Now, I'm not saying that we'll all get to see heaven opened up in our moment of trial. But what I am saying is that the Spirit will come and fill us and show us whatever it is our hearts need to see and give us whatever power we need to complete the task set before us, to run the race set before us. And what Acts wants to do for us as a church is help us see that this doesn't just kind of happen once in a while. This is what happens in the church. It just wants to see this as the regular expectation of the church. Why can you step out and do that hard thing? Why can you step out into persecution? Why can you share the gospel? Why can you be the Christian weirdo at the coffee shop? Why can you do all those things? Why, why, why? Because the Spirit will meet you in the moment. That's what we're supposed to see time and time again. Acts 2.2 and 2.4, the Spirit fills them at Pentecost. We see it in Peter as he preaches in Acts 2 and Acts 4. We see it again with the people in Acts 4.31 as they gather to pray for boldness and preach the gospel. We'll see it later in the ministry of Paul. This is what the Spirit does. This isn't some strange, weird thing that we just cross our fingers and hope for. It brings it up so much so it becomes normalized. What do I expect in the hour of great trial? Great power from the Holy Spirit to sustain me. 
Imagine a glass of water that gets filled up until it's overflowing. That's what this is like. We always have the Holy Spirit. Praise God, right? We always have the Holy Spirit. Isn't, I mean, what a gift to be filled with the fullness of God. But we see these moments of unique power and help that come in, in a moment of need to help us overflow. Our God is gracious. I want to build this confidence in you. When the hour of trial comes, if you don't have this confidence too late, I want you to have it now before the hour of trial comes. So as you walk into the hard thing, the hard situation, you walk into whatever the Lord has placed before you, you just go, the Holy Spirit's going to meet me. I know it. I've seen it. It's what He does. We should be a people devoted to the Word in prayer and fasting, these means that the Spirit works through for day by day power and sustaining. Breathe in, breathe out. It's just the daily rhythm of our lives. But we can also know that in the moment we need it most, when we feel like we won't be able to rise to the occasion, we don't have to. The Spirit will rise up from within us and give us all we need. And notice what the Spirit shows Stephen And then what Stephen just blurts out and tells the crowd, right? This is something he could have kept to himself if he wanted to be safe. He sees the glory of God. And he sees Jesus, the Son of Man, standing at the right hand of God. Now what I want you to see is that this is a combination of two Old Testament texts with a very unique update. (laughs) Combination of two Old Testament texts with a very unique update. Update. So the first thing I want you to see is the Son of Man language. Daniel 7, 13 to 14 is a vision Daniel has of one like a Son of Man, it says, that is given all authority and an everlasting kingdom from the ancient of days. He comes and he receives all authority, an everlasting kingdom. When Jesus comes on the scene, this is the title that he uses most about himself the Son of Man. So Stephen hears with no uncertain terms describing Jesus as the one from Daniel 7 that receives all authority in an everlasting kingdom. It might sneak by us as English readers, but it would not have snuck by the rulers and the authorities here who are Old Testament junkies, right? The other Old Testament text that comes to mind is Psalm 110.1. The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. This has already been quoted in Acts 2. Jesus is the one at the right hand waiting to put all enemies under his feet. But here in Acts 7, there's an update to this picture, isn't there? Do you see it? Psalm 110.1 Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. But here in Acts 7, Jesus is not sitting, but standing. So what is going on? Again, you can read all sorts of commentators about it, but I just want to read you a quote from Kevin DeYoung that I think succinctly sums up what is going on here. So here's what he says. He says this, Why is Jesus standing instead of sitting? It's for this reason. He has stood to receive Stephen's testimony and to be his advocate. He has stood that he might come forward to be the judge of those who will trample upon God's prophet. Jesus is rising from his throne to come to Stephen's defense and to judge his persecutors. That's a vision that would give you confidence in front of a mob. Let me read the last sentence one more time. Jesus is rising from his throne to come to Stephen's defense and to judge his persecutors. So what is the Spirit showing Stephen in this moment? What should we take away from this? What we should take away is that while the rulers think they're putting Stephen on trial, Stephen has a vision of the one who will judge the living and the dead. He's not on trial. They're on trial. It's not just seen in the way he talks here. It's seen in the heavens. While the rulers think they have the authority... Stephen is seen the one, his Savior and friend and King, who has all authority in a kingdom that will last forever. Stephen is seeing and then declaring out loud in the midst of this mob who wants to kill him that he sees Jesus. He says, I see Jesus, the Son of Man, in the very throne room of God, making him equal with God, standing to vindicate me and judge you. He's declaring the deity and the authority of Jesus Christ 
as the Savior, the leader, and the Lord. And this is what the Spirit will do for us. This is what He'll do for us. Show us Christ. That we might see His glory, remember His work, rest in His authority, be empowered to do whatever He calls us to do for the joy set before us. Do you believe it? I just want us to believe this. I don't want you to leave here weak. You are weak, but if you can trust this one, you can know I can just walk into this. Like, I can't walk into any of the rooms I walked into this week without knowing this. And neither can you. But this is true. This isn't some weird Old Testament vision thing. This is reality. This is the curtain pulled back, the door open. We get a peek into what's real, more real than any of your sins, any of your struggles, any of your suffering. This is real. Point number three, the violence of the rulers. Look at verses 57 to 58 here. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. So we see our first martyr first martyr of the church. We see it commissioned under the leadership of Saul. The laying down of the garment shows an honoring that's taking place. He's saying, this is okay, I approve of this. Now some people see this as merely mob violence. It's just a crowd that got out of control and got offended, so they rushed Stephen. Certainly that's part of what happens. But I want you to see more than that. I want you to see how intentional it was and therefore see the depth of the wickedness at play here. This isn't just mob violence in a moment. It's an intentional, ugly, hateful thing they're doing when they think they're being righteous. Notice that it says they stopped their ears and they rushed at Stephen. Kids, have you ever been frustrated or seen someone else frustrated and covered your ears? Na 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 na. Right? What what are you doing in that moment? Right? You just you don't want to hear. <laughs> you don't want to hear anymore. You're frustrated. You're mad at whoever is doing that. You're angry. Right? Some of you kids are looking at your parents like you did it yesterday. That's what's kind of happening here. Right? They don't want to hear what Stephen is saying about Jesus. They're frustrated. They're angry. They're covering their ears. And they think they're doing that. But what Stephen has already told us, what the Word of God has already told us, is that they're covering their ears because they're not able to hear because they have hard hearts. Remember where Pastor Daniel ended last week in verses 51 to 52. We're supposed to see this connection. He says to them, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in hearts and what? Ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one. He just said, you have uncircumcised hearts and ears. You can't hear. And as he's telling them the truth, what are they doing? No, 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 no. They don't want to hear because they're unable to hear. So they harden their hearts, they stop their ears. This murder has a deeply spiritual cause. They're hardened, uncircumcised ears and hearts. But, but more than that, to show you the deception of sin, it's not just they have uncircumcised hearts and ears, but they think what they're doing is right. I want to show you that. They think what he just did, because he did, is make Jesus equal with God and therefore blaspheme. Now I want you to hear what's going on in their minds as they hear him speaking. Listen to Leviticus 24, 14 to 16. So if you get to Leviticus every year and stop reading, I'm going to give you a little motiva- motivation to read. So here's what's going on. Leviticus 24, 14 to 16. It says, bring out of the camp the one who is cursed and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head And let all the congregation stone him. Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death, and all the congregation shall stone him. 
And that's what happened. I want you to see this is not just an offended people. It's an intentional, blind, and outraged mob thinking they are defending the name of God. That's a warning to us as a church in this day and age. This is a people that is so missing Jesus that they carry out capital punishment on Stephen who's proclaiming his name. Instead of realizing Jesus came fulfilled the law, died the death for our sins. They harden their hearts, carry out the old covenant law, and kill Stephen like they killed Jesus. This is the first martyr, and it leads to a widespread, violent persecution led at least in part by Saul. Look at verses 1 and 3 of chapter 8. It says, And Saul approved of his execution, And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And Saul was ravaging the church. Entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. I want you to see two things in those verses we just read from chapter 8. First, we need to count the cost of following Jesus. You've got to count the cost. This has been the story of the church. The story of the church is God with us and the story of the church. It's persecution, even death. Peter, Saul, Paul, and James, the great early leaders of the church, would also be executed. The underground church, now in the Middle East and in China, are just two examples in our day of places where the cost is this high. There are other places. We see the cultural tide beginning to turn against the name and ways of Jesus in our own nation. And we just need to pause once in a while and count the cost. Jesus tells us to do that. He says, count the cost before you do that thing or that thing. Count the cost. Are you all in for Jesus? What if it gets worse than you think? Are you all in for Jesus? Is He worth it? But the other thing we need to see at the very same time in these verses, is the unstoppable purpose of God. Right? Paul himself, Saul, is a display of that. Right? He is the murderer that later becomes the martyr. God is working in all these things. But I want you to see an even bigger picture of how God is working even in the persecution of His church. So let me remind you of the beginning of Acts and the words of Jesus from Acts 1.8. He says, You will receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. Where will they be His witnesses? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, right? Where is the church in Jerusalem scattered to in these verses? Judea and Samaria. Do you think the Bible mentions that by accident? Or is it wanting us to see God's working? Jesus is working and teaching. It looks like they're winning. It looks like persecution is winning. Jesus is just carrying out His plan. Does God's presence leave His people when they're scattered? Of course not, right? The whole point is we are the temple. Living, moving, breathing centers of worship for Jesus Christ. We don't have to come to one place anymore. So as we scatter, there's no loss. There's only gain because Jesus is spreading. So even as they're scattered by violent persecution, they're fulfilling the purposes of God to send them to Judea and Samaria to gather a people for His name. They are scattered as a people that they might gather a people. We're supposed to see that here. This is the first way church planting happens. By the first martyr and by widespread violent persecution. What they mean for evil in the snuffing out of God's people, God means for good in the spreading out of His people. Listen, there are are so many empires. I just encourage all of you, just take some basic church history classes. And here's why. What, What you'll see is you will see that throughout history there has been empire after empire, ruler after ruler, regime after regime that has tried to snuff out Christianity. So it's, it's going to be done here. All of them are gone. 
and we're sitting here. All of them are gone, and we're sitting here, and it will be that way until Jesus returns. They will continue to rise up, continue to try to snuff out, and all of them will pass away, and here the church will sit. Because God keeps his promises and works his purposes, spreading through suffering, proclamation through persecution. This is God's economy. This is his strength made perfect in weakness. What looks like a bloody death ends in resurrection life. That's how it's always working in the providence of God. So let's get here to the application. The presence of God with us in faithful dying. So look at verses 59 to 60 here as Stephen's dying right before our eyes. It says, And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And look at verse 2 of chapter 8. And devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. I'm going to tell you the phrase that stuck out to me this week that just hasn't stuck out before quite the same way. And it's this phrase that says, and as they were stoning Stephen. Thought about that a lot. Not before they stoned him. That's not what it says. It says, as they were stoning him, (laughs) rocks are flying. He's being pummeled. So much so that he's falling to his knees as the rocks continue to hit him. Right? It, it doesn't say, after he convinced them of his position and won them back over to his side. It doesn't say that. It says, as they were stoning him. So, someone's, there's a group of people stoning you? What are you thinking? Like, what's going through, through your mind in that moment? And right now, you're going, oh, anger and hate and fear. And I want to encourage you again. I think you'd be closer to Stephen than you think. Because the Lord will meet you in that moment with the power of His Holy Spirit. So what is Stephen thinking? Well, I see two themes. And they're good themes to end on today. Trust and forgiveness. I've been praying this week, Lord, would you make us a people, this kind of deep trust and these kinds of hearts of forgiveness, the world would not know what to do with us. Now, I don't have to tell you if you've been around church for a while that Stephen is following in the footsteps of his Savior and Lord here. We're meant to see that. He's, he's becoming like Christ in his death, in his sufferings. In order that by any means possible, he may attain the resurrection from the dead. That's what Paul says in Philippians 3. Like Jesus... Stephen cries out in anticipation of being in glory with an expression of trust. Jesus, receive my spirit. Jesus, I trust you. Jesus, I've proclaimed you. Jesus, I've followed you. I've told them about you. I'm following in your suffering, becoming like you in your death. I'm trusting that I'll follow you in your resurrection. Jesus, I see you now, but soon I'm going to see more. Jesus, you're with me now by your spirit, and soon I'll be with you in a fuller experience of glory. This is an expression of trust that Jesus will finish the work he started. And God will give you that kind of assurance in your hour of need. The second thing we see here is, remember, Stephen sees the judge of the universe standing. He's there to receive his plea. He's there to judge his persecutors. And as he sees the judge standing there, He doesn't plead for their condemnation. It's not what he pleads for to the judge. He pleads for their forgiveness. Forgiveness of his enemies. He says, do not hold this sin against them. You remember the words of Jesus, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. We just saw these people don't know what they're doing. Their hearts are hard. Their ears are uncircumcised. They're stopping them. And I just thought this week, you know what flies in the face of a cancel culture that is always outraged? Forgiveness. 
we, we, we <laughs> live in a day and age where we just want to qualify everything. Here's what forgiveness is not. <laughs> and that's okay. We should know what forgiveness is not. That's a good thing to know. The Bible talks about that. But sometimes, we just take ourselves off the hook for just forgiveness. I mean, when you think about what Christ has done for us, it is radical. It's almost ridiculous. Just for me. <laughs> I think about what He's done for me. And I'm going to multiply that out in this room. And even out in the comments, He's even forgiven them. And at home. Right? The, if you think about what Christ has done. I want us to be a deeply forgiving people. How, how can you be a forgiving person? How can we be forgiving people? When we have hearts filled with the Holy Spirit that see the reality of heaven opened up with Jesus at the right hand of God as the final judge and therefore looks on our enemies with compassion instead of contempt. Church, do we remember that we're forgiven? I hear Stacy Thorpe says all the time when we're with people in our staff meetings, if we're going to be a forgiving people, we have to remember first that we're forgiven. You just, you just won't be a forgiving person if you kind of forget the baseline. Do we remember that apart from the work of God, we would have had hard hearts and closed ears going na 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 to Jesus until the day we died? When you look around at a culture that is gathering with hard hearts and a new law, that demands punishment and canceling of Christians and Christian ideas, ask yourself honestly, do you mainly feel contempt or compassion? Do you mainly feel frustration or forgiveness? Do you feel a deep anxiety and fear? Or do you have a deep rest and faith in the plans and purposes of God who turns suffering into spreading and persecution into proclamation. What goes on in your heart in those moments? And I just want to point out one more thing here, significant, I think, from verse 2. Stephen's just been murdered unjustly. He's innocent, like his Savior was. How does the church respond? Do they take up stones? Okay, you want to you wanna party? Let's party. What do they do? They, it says they lament. And I'm convinced, if you read my letter from Friday, one of the categories we need to redevelop as a church is the, the category of lament. What is lament? Lament is broken-hearted, hope-filled grief. Broken-hearted, hope-filled grief. Things are not as they should be. Sin is real. Suffering is real. Death is really still the last enemy. Our culture does not love Jesus, and we ought to be brokenhearted over that. We ought to think about it enough to have grief over it, to have sad hearts. Right? We ought not to just numb it with Netflix or numb it by looking for another blog that reinforces our opinion or, or numb it with that addiction. Like, Don't do that. Think about it. Sit in it. Feel the grief and brokenness of it. It is ugly and wicked in us and around us. Feel it. Don't be afraid to feel it. Yet. <laughs> As we look at the cross and the resurrection, sin and suffering do not have the final word. Death is a defeated enemy. One day soon, all tears will be wiped away. We'll gather around the throne of our God and the Lamb that was slain to declare He is worthy and it was worth all of it. No one's going to get to that throne room and go, wasn't worth it. We need this category of lament in an age that would tempt us towards outrage and repaying evil for evil. Christian lament mourns evil, but sees a future hope that presses us to keep speaking, keep working, keep trusting for the joy set before us. Lament helps us cry out in broken-hearted trust that God is still in control and give our lives to pushing back the darkness as much as we can. So let me end with this quote from the book we just preached through, 1 Peter verses 12 to 14. Here's what Peter says. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you 
as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Why? Because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. As insults rest upon you by the canceling culture, the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you because of your crucified King. He will not leave you. He will not leave us. The Spirit that is with us in faithful living will be with us until our faithful dying. He is with us. He is for us. He will accomplish His purposes through His people for their good and the glory of His name. And while He does it, He will never, not one moment of our lives, leave us or forsake us. Let me pray. So Lord, as we take a few minutes here now, before we come to the table, we just confess that we're often wondering where you are. We're often begrudging the race that you've set before us. We look around with more contempt than we do compassion. So Lord, in this moment, as we get ready to eat and drink with you, would you work in us a gospel confidence that because of the blood of Jesus, you will keep your promise to never leave us or forsake us, that because of the blood of Jesus, we can look on our enemies and the culture around us with compassion instead of contempt. And because of the blood of Jesus, we know the Spirit will be with us as we go forth into whatever you have for us and in all the sufferings and all the struggles that are coming, that you'll meet us in the hour of need. And you'll give us what we need to act for the sake of your name and to sustain us until the day we see you face to face. So Lord, as we meditate for these two minutes, show us Christ. Show us our sin. Show us what we need to lay down at the foot of the cross. Pray this in Jesus' name. Thank you for listening to this message from Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Feel free to make copies of this message to give to others. But please do not charge for these copies or alter their content in any way without written permission from Bethlehem Baptist Church. For more information, we invite you to visit us online at Bethlehem.Church or write us at 720 13th Avenue South, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55415. Bethlehem Baptist Church, spreading a passion for the supremacy of God in all things, for the joy of all peoples, through Jesus Christ.